Everyone loves interesting stories about haunted houses, at least among the viewers of this video, otherwise you simply would not have opened it. Hello, my dear friends, this is Mr. Top F and for those who don't like short videos and little tops, I have prepared a big release with a compilation of the best videos about haunted houses on my channel, as well as stories of their real origin. Before we start, be sure to subscribe to my channel and turn on notifications so you don't miss the next compilations, and like this video, if you are enjoyed the content I make. Get ready to be scared, we start. Monte Cristo Homestead Monte Cristo literally means Mountain of Christ, but the names and intentions can be deceiving. Victorian Mansion, built in 1884, sits high on a hill overlooking the New South Wales town of Junee in Australia. The estate was the financial and social center of Christoph William Crawley's empire. Monte Cristo's high elevation and the religious name are contrasted with several untimely deaths, accidents, and cruelty that caused trouble for the estate and led to innumerable stories of tormented spirits that still roam the home and estate grounds. Crawley purchased two parcels of land totaling 520 acres in January 1876 under the terms of the Australian Robertson Act of 1861. He tried to work his land and somehow managed to survive. A little later he got lucky. The Great Southern Railway was being laid and Crawley built a railway hotel across the street from what soon became a busy railway station. With the construction of the railway, Crawley had more opportunities to trade his agricultural products, and the hotel business began to improve with an influx of travelers. The tiny village grew, and Crawley, growing rich, bought more land. He grew rich further and in 1883 became one of the founders of the city. In 1876, Crowley built a small brick cottage for his family, which is still owned by Monte Cristo as the original estate. Just nine years later, the cottage no longer fit Crawley's social status. A new, larger building was needed. In 1884, a new mansion was built from high-quality materials. The old manor became a servant's house. For the award-winning horses, the Crawleys added a stable and built a dairy farm along with other buildings on the estate. In 1898, Mr. Crawley sold one of his estates, the Juni Loftus Hotel, for the huge sum of 10,000 pounds to Mrs. O'Donnell. Distrustful of banknotes, Crawley insisted that payment be made in gold sovereigns. The gold was brought in a big sack and Mr. Crawley counted the coins to make sure he hadn't been cheated before handing over the ownership of the hotel. It is not known where the sovereigns went. Many believe that the gold was hidden in the house or buried in the estate. This part of the legend will cause problems for Monte Cristo in the future. The first official death at the Monte Cristo estate occurred when one of the Crawley maids was carrying their baby daughter. The maid said that some invisible force had pushed the child out of her arms. The child tumbled down the main staircase of the house and died of bruises. Mr. Crawley died at Monte Cristo on December 14, 1910, at the age of 69. He developed a carbuncle on his neck, the infection worsened due to starched shirt collars, and blood poisoning occurred which caused heart failure. Mrs. Elizabeth Lydia Crawley became so distraught at the death of her husband that she became reclusive. Mrs. Crawley, who lived long after her husband's death, was rumored to be a lot of cruelty. In addition, the inhabitants of the city did not respect Elizabeth, who was left without a husband, to some extent because of racism, Elizabeth's partial aboriginal ancestry gave some locals reason to look down on her mixed heritage. She converted one of the storage rooms upstairs into a chapel where she immersed herself in Bible reading. Elizabeth did not dare to go out from Monte Cristo during the last 23 years of her life, which ended on August 12, 1933, due to a ruptured appendix. Reginald Ryan has been the owner of Monte Cristo since 1963 and an expert on the history of the house. He talked about the brutality at Monte Cristo, there was a girl who was pushed off the balcony, although it was determined that it was an accident. She was a servant and was expecting a child at the time. She died. One of the young people who worked and lived here, one morning did not go to work, but his owner ordered, go to work. The young man replied that he was sick. 
The owner thought that he was pretending and set fire to a straw mattress, so the young man did not have time to get out and burn down. The housekeeper's son, Harold Steele, was mentally handicapped, so he was put in chains for 49 years. The story of Harold Steele is perhaps the most heartbreaking tragedy in Monte Cristo. At the estate's dairy farm, poor Harold was chained to the wall like an animal. There, near the door, you can still see the hole in the wall, worn by his chain. After Mrs. Crawley's death, Harold's mother assumed the role of housekeeper, and she and her son were the only permanent residents of Monte Cristo. Unfortunately, Mrs. Steele died of a heart attack in the main house, and it was not until a few days later that the town noticed her absence. When the police eventually investigated, they found Harold curled up like an embryo and lying in his feces. His body was dehydrated, he was practically dying of hunger, and he missed his mother terribly. Harold was sent to Kenmore, a home for the mentally ill, where he died a few months later. After Mrs. Steele's death, the condition of the house continued to deteriorate because no one cared for it. The last member of the Crowley family who lived in the mansion left in 1948, only housekeeper Jack Simpson remained at Monte Cristo. In 1961, Hitchcock's action movie Psycho was shown in Juni. After a local man saw the film three times and liked the idea, he crept up to Monte Cristo, shot and killed an unsuspecting Jack Simpson. Today, you can still see died Jack Haha scrawled on the door of a dairy farm, either by the killer or by some local with a sick sense of humor. In the next two years, the house was completely open to vandals and robbers who were looking for Crawley's gold sovereigns and vandalized the building. The house attracted the native Wagga Wagga, Reginald Ryan. In 1963, he and his wife Olive bought the estate for 1,000 pounds. Not a single whole window remained in the house, electrical wiring was not carried out, and vandals destroyed all the rooms. But the Ryan family dreamed of putting everything in order and doing business in antiques. The first time they saw a ghost was three days after moving into the house. Ryan said, in the evening we went to the city center to buy food, and when we arrived back, there was light streaming from all the doorways and windows. Do you know how light flows in fog? That was the kind of light. My wife was next to me, so it was not a hallucination. We stopped the car and looked at the house. My wife didn't want to go there. But as we got closer to the house, all the lights went out. According to Ryan, Monte Cristo is haunted by at least 10 ghosts. Some psychics who visited the house in the late 1990s for an Australian TV show believed that the woman who was killed in the house was one of those 10 ghosts. Although no information about the murdered woman was found, perhaps, if anything happened, the Crawley family was held in such high regard that it was likely that the local police did not put up a strong interrogation. Matt Bowden of the Australian Ghostbusters Society, AGS, lives in Canberra, Australia. The first time he came to Monte Cristo in search of ghosts was in 2001, when he took a tour of Ridge Ryan. He told me about one particular incident in the mansion. I felt several cold places, especially in the room called the drawing room, where the mistress of the house, Mrs. Crawley, used to sit and sew. I felt cold in the corner of that room. Then there was a psychic on our tour who told me that Mrs. Crawley was sitting in a chair not far from me. I did not see her, did not even feel her presence, but I felt the cold in that place. I had a digital thermometer with me, part of my ghost chasing equipment, and it showed the drop in temperature. Bowden recalled that although the Monte Cristo estate had a terrible past, which he was well aware of before he entered the estate, now the house is quite warm and hospitable. In 2003, Bowden returned for a week at Monte Cristo with seven of his AGS colleagues. During the study of the group, one of the mentally sensitive women felt short of breath in the boys' room, which was located upstairs. Other psychics and mediums also spoke of the heavy pressure on them in that room. The psychic from AGS was forced to leave the room after a short stay due to pressure on her chest. In the sitting room upstairs, AGS held a seance in an attempt to contact the spirits of Monte Cristo. Bowden said, I used to do sessions as a kid, but this one seemed pretty worth it. 
The Ouija tablet was going crazy. She pointed in all directions. We contacted a guy named James. He wasn't housebound, I don't think so, but he was there while we were doing the session. We asked if we could take a picture of him, and he replied that he was standing by the fireplace. So I took a picture. When I took the photo, there was a strange swirling bright light in the right corner of the photo. I'm not a photography expert, but to me, this light is like something captured on film. Something is going on in the house. Today, Monte Cristo is a well-maintained home that houses priceless antiques collected over the years by Reg Ryan and restored to their original splendor. If the setting isn't enough to remind visitors of how the city's richest family must have lived a hundred years ago, Mr. and Mrs. Crawley can appear in sophisticated Victorian-era attire and you can see them for yourself. Just hope they don't take you for a servant. The Rectory in Borley the Rectory in Borley is an old mansion located in the village of Borley, Essex, in the UK. The building was built in 1863 by the priest Henry Bull for his family. Residents warned the priest that the place he had chosen for the construction of the mansion was far from the best. Next to him they often saw the ghost of a young woman with a pale sickly face and black clothes to the floor and they tried to bypass that place. According to rumors, on the site of the construction of the mansion in the 14th century, Benedictine and convents were located close to each other. One day, one of the monks fell in love with a nun named Maria and managed to persuade her to run away with him. But the plan was not destined to come true because of the denunciation, as a result of which the plot to escape was revealed and the fugitives were captured next to the horse-drawn cart. The lovers were severely punished the monk was hanged almost immediately, and Mary was walled up alive in one of the stone walls of the monastery. After some time, in the park near him, they began to notice a girl in gray clothes, slowly strolling along one of the park alleys, later called the Nun's Alley. At the beginning of the 18th century, the monastery was destroyed, but the ghost of a nun continued to appear regularly. The Bull family did not differ in superstition and did not believe the stories of their neighbors, but they felt oddities in the new house almost immediately after moving in. At night, steps and strange sounds were heard, the voices of strangers singing accompanied by the organ playing, and a man without a head walked along the corridors. In the courtyard, a translucent wagon could be seen from time to time. Sometimes children woke up from the presence in their room of some strangers, whose appearance was strange and unusual. In the dining room, it was decided to block the window with bricks, because the nun often looked into it, frightening those who were eating. The attendants in the bull's house did not linger, and outsiders, who had heard about what was happening, tried never to enter it. Despite all this, in some surprising way, the bulls got used to the atmosphere in the house and got along with the ghosts under one roof. The father of the family even built a summer house next to Nun's Alley, wanting to get a better look at the ghost. After the death of the parish priest, after almost 30 years of living in a haunted house, his son Harry Bull continued his father's work, becoming a local priest. He died, like his father, in the blue room of the mansion, and subsequent residents claimed that the blue room was characterized by increased anomalous activity. Witnesses claimed that they saw the ghost of Harry Bull, dressed in clothes, at a funeral. The house was empty for about a year until the young Smith family moved in. At first, the young did not understand why the house had been empty for so long, but the inexplicable phenomena occurring in the house put everything in its place. The ghosts of the house did not hide their presence at all, but harmed and frightened the new tenants. The Smiths did not live even a year in the house, and after them, Harry Bull's cousin and his young wife became the inhabitants of Borley Rectory. They lived in the house for five years, and the ghosts mocked them, bells rang, keys disappeared, things fell, and various sounds, steps, and screams were heard. Spouses lying in bed were doused with water, ghosts appeared in turn, and one of them was Henry Bull. One day the mistress of the house found an envelope with a note addressed to her. The message contained one single word, leave. They soon left the mansion. Borley Rectory has been examined for paranormality more than once, and everyone managed to feel the strange features of this house. 
During the study of incomprehensible phenomena, it was possible to establish contact with the spirit of the nun Maria, and he warned that the house would soon burn down. And so it happened. Even the absence of a house does not prevent the appearance of phantoms next to him. And now some of the inhabitants of the mansion can be met, which often happens. Borley Rectory, as well as the surrounding area, is recognized as a place densely populated by various phantoms. Villa de Vecchi This old house is located among the mountains of Italy, near Lake Como in the Lombardy region, in the province of Lecco. Villa de Vecchi, also known as the Red House, House of the Witches, is now derelict and abandoned, its once dramatic splendor tainted by time and graffiti. The history of the villa begins in the 1850s, when Count Felix de Vecchi, returning from long journeys around the world, decided to build a cozy nest for his family. Count de Vecchi, 1816 to 1862, was a famous war hero, an accomplished artist, and an explorer who, as part of the National Guard, played an important role in the liberation of Milan from Austria during the unification of Italy. In his younger years, he traveled extensively in the Middle East, Egypt, and India and published a book that sold well and included his illustrations. When the Count married Carolina Franchetti di Ponte in 1844, they went on a journey through all the regions of Italy, during which the Count continued to write about his adventures. By the time the newlyweds returned to Milan, the Count had become a celebrity for his romantic visions of the places he visited. In 1854, the Count commissioned the architect Alessandro Sidioli to build a summer retreat inspired by the architecture of the eastern worlds he had visited in his youth. Unfortunately, Alessandro Sidioli passed away before the building could be completed. Here the most interesting begins. According to rumors surrounding the Red House, the De Vecchi family shared a handful of happy years at the villa, but those happy times ended on a night in 1862 when the Count was away. Legend has it that the Count returned to find his wife brutally murdered, her face mutilated, and her daughter missing. Although the Earl tried in vain to find his missing daughter, she was never seen again. The desperate father searched for weeks in the surrounding woods, but was never able to find her. The information and memories of what happened that night caused the Count to commit suicide less than a year later. He died at the age of 46. The ownership passed to the brother of the Count of Baiego, and it remained in the family until the outbreak of World War II. It then belonged to several different aristocratic families until it was finally abandoned in the 1960s. Perhaps its most famous guest was Aleister Crowley, who supposedly stayed in the early 1920s. According to the myth, the house became the site of satanic rituals carried out by those wishing to direct the bad energy locked within the walls of the house. Locals say that on quiet nights they can still hear the Count playing the piano from the ruins. Another version of the villa story was less frightening, but less and less mentioned. They say that the Count demanded the construction of a red house, wanting to take advantage of the thermal springs that can be found nearby, but he was already a widower by the time he hired Alessandro Sidioli. By the beginning of 1860-1990s, the Count fell seriously ill with chronic liver disease and spent the last months of his life between his possessions in Milan and Court Nova, painting and caring for his children. He died in Milan at the age of 46 from liver failure, leaving his wealth and possessions and the care of his two young children to his brother Baiego. But the calm version did not stop the ghost hunters. People still believe in the paranormal energy of the villa, and the appearance and events in it repeatedly confirm this. The Red House today is a grandiose shell of a bygone era. The windows were long gone, and Mother Nature began to tear apart the brickwork. In 2002, an avalanche destroyed many houses in those places, but the Red House miraculously remained untouched. Casa de las Siete Chimeneas or the House of the Seven Chimneys Casa de las Siete Chimeneas was built between 1574 to 1577 in the Renaissance style, designed by the architect Antonio Solero, created for Pedro de la Desma, secretary of Antonio Perez. The building often changed its owners. It was owned by merchants from Genoa, industrialists, doctors, representatives of the Castilian bourgeoisie, 
and even the Minister of Finance of Spain. The building got its name as a result of one of the first reconstructions when the architect Andrea Lorano transformed the tiled roof and installed seven chimneys on it. The building was repeatedly robbed, reconstructed, and completed, but thanks to the reverent attitude of residents, it retained its original appearance. This is one of the examples of civil architecture of the 16th century that has survived to this day. During the reign of King Alfonso XIII and before the start of the Civil War, it was the residents of the Women's Lyceum, a club of feminists of that time who defended the equality of women and their integration into the business world. Between 1980 and 1989, Banco Urgito was located here, and now the Spanish Ministry of Culture is based here. In 1948, the House of Seven Chimneys was recognized as a historical art monument. In the 1970s, a large built-in sundial was installed on the facade. This building in Madrid is known not so much for its unusual architecture, but for the legends surrounding it, which are associated with the name of King Philip II. According to one of them, the house was built for an annoying mistress who bothered the king and prevented him from quietly marrying for the fourth time. Once she managed to escape from the castle, she met an elderly nobleman and decided to marry him to make the king jealous and even invited him to her wedding. The girl hoped that the monarch would cancel his engagement upon learning of this. However, she was disappointed because the king did not give up his idea and even became an honored guest at the wedding of his former mistress, or rather, the groom's best man. Not wanting to live with an unloved person, the young bride went down to the basement before her wedding night and stabbed herself with a dagger. After that, rumors spread around the city that her ghost in a white dress appears on the roof of the house on a full moonwalk between the seven chimneys and looks longingly at the royal palace where her lover lived. According to another version, the mistress of the king lived in the house of ghosts with her husband, whom she loved very much. The poor thing died of grief when the monarch decided to get rid of her rival and sent her husband to war, where he died. The body of the sufferer was walled up by her father in one of the walls of the palace, after which he committed suicide. And finally, according to the third version, the king built this house for his illegitimate daughter, who went crazy, and seven chimneys represent seven deadly sins. These legends are not completely groundless. Skeletons from the times of the 16th century have been found more than once in the cellars of the ghost house. One of them was even with a dagger in his chest, and the other two were walled up in the walls of the house. The current inhabitants of the building constantly complain about incomprehensible phenomena occurring in the house. The Limp Mansion Not every haunted house has its ghost, rather the opposite. Most often, such legends are composed on purpose to attract tourists or reduce the cost of real estate. But in the case of the Lemp family mansion in St. Louis, Missouri, we are dealing with an exception to the rule. Family History In 1838, Johann Lemp moved from Germany to America and opened a store in St. Louis where he sold beer made according to his recipe. The beer of the German immigrant was to the liking of the Americans, for them it was a fundamentally different taste. In addition, Johann brewed his beer and stored it according to all the rules in natural refrigerators, limestone caves stretching under the city. Business started to grow. In just a couple of years, Lem began to produce beer on an industrial scale. And 20 years later, he was already considered the number one brewer in St. Louis. In 1862, the beer king died, bequeathing the business to his son William. He expanded the family business. Lemp's brewery occupied an entire block of the city. Caves for storing beer were no longer needed. Instead, William built an ice house and even later purchased refrigerators. Good luck accompanied William in his personal life. He married Julia Feeker and they had eight children, sons William, Louis, Charles, Frederick, and Edwin and daughters Anna, Hilda, and Elsa. A big family needed a big house. Then William bought mansion from his father-in-law and rebuilt the building following his ideas of comfort and luxury. The Limps moved there, hoping to live happily ever after. Many envied the success and prosperity of this family. But soon fate turned its back on them. Divorce from Lady Lavender 
In 1892, William Lemp retired, entrusting the management of the company to William Jr., whom everyone called Billy. But at the same time, Frederick, Lemp's favorite son, was supposed to inherit the family business. Frederick knew about his father's plans and readily steadied the beer business. However, in 1901 he fell seriously ill and the doctors advised him to go to warm California for treatment. Alas, the move did not help, the young man died, and, according to rumors, this was accompanied by some mysterious circumstances. The father grieved the death of his beloved son. In addition, his close friend, also a brewer, soon died. Limp sank into depression. He could sit at the table for hours, staring at one point. In February 1904, this successful man, who was worth an estimated $16 million, shot himself in the head while in his bedroom. A year later, his wife Julia was diagnosed with cancer. She died in 1906, in the same room as her husband. After the death of his parents, Billy took over the management of the company. But he loved the wildlife too much. Noisy parties were constantly held in the house, alcohol flowed like a river. In addition, he often beat his wife, the beautiful Lillian Handlin, a trendsetter, who was called Lady Lavender for her love of lavender. In the end, Lillian could not stand it and in 1908 she filed for divorce. In court, the couple did not skimp on the accusations. Billy claimed that his wife leads an immoral lifestyle and swears and wears lavender dresses specifically to attract other men. And Lillian talked about women of easy virtue in the matrimonial bedroom and the tyranny of her husband. The court hearings were public. The personal life of the Lemps became public and the subject of discussion in the press. In the divorce, Billy lost much of his fortune and custody of his son. Black Streak since then, trouble has relentlessly followed the family. In 1920, Elsa Lemp committed suicide. She shot herself in her parents' bedroom. In the same year, prohibition was passed. Other companies somehow survived this. They switched to the production of non-alcoholic beer and soft drinks. Billy, on the other hand, suffered losses but did nothing to get out of the crisis. Things were getting worse for the company, and in 1922, Billy had to sell it for a pittance. This was a big blow for him. On December 29, 1922, he shot himself in the heart while sitting in his father's office at the Lemp home. In 1929, the Lemp mansion was passed to Charles, who was called an evil and boring person. A recluse, he preferred the company of his dog to human society. In 1941, Charles instructed the funeral home exactly how to bury him. He forbade holding a memorial service, writing obituaries, and ordered his body to be cremated. And after eight years, he shot his dog, after which he put a bullet in his own forehead. None of the Lemps have lived in the house since. The youngest of the brothers, Edwin, settled in the suburbs of St. Louis. Until the age of 90, he bought and collected works of art that once belonged to the Lemp family. Cursed Place When Richard Pointer bought the Lemp house in 1975 to open a restaurant there, the mansion was in a terrible state. It had to be restored. Once, when Pointer was painting the walls in the bathroom, he felt someone's eyes on him. But he was completely alone in the house. However, the feeling that someone was watching him did not disappear. As a result, Richard chose to leave the mansion and hired the artist Claude Breckwell to restore the painted ceilings. But the artist did not stay long. He also felt that he was being watched and refused the order. He didn't even take his tools. However, the house had been restored and the restaurant was open. Once Pointer's son Dick stayed there to spend the night with his dog, a Doberman named Shadow. During the night, they were awakened by a sound like something heavy hitting a wall. A search of the house yielded no results. On another occasion, when Dick was staying at the mansion after the restaurant closed, he heard someone playing the piano. Of course, he could not find this someone either. Many inexplicable events took place in the mansion, which was witnessed by both the owners and the guests. Candles lit by themselves, objects moved from place to place, 
drawers and cupboards and chests of drawers opened and closed, indistinct voices and the sound of horse hooves were heard. Because of this, employees who worked for the pointers quit one after another. Today, the Limp Mansion, owned by a certain Halim, houses a restaurant, a bar, and a hotel that costs $125 per night. But even at this price, the hotel is so popular that places in it are booked a year in advance. Guests craving a meeting with the ghosts of the Lemp family are offered accommodation in one of four rooms, the Lavender, William Lemp, Elsa Lemp, and Frederick and Louis Lemp suites. Each of these rooms can offer its ghost to visitors. And the night spent in William Lemp, in addition, guarantees that the next morning the guest will have an inexplicable feeling of melancholy and anxiety. Waitress Bonnie Strayhorn said that early one morning before the restaurant opened, she saw a man sitting at a table with his back to her. When the girl asked if he wanted to drink coffee, he nodded his head in the affirmative. But as soon as Bonnie turned away from the visitor for a second, he disappeared as if he had vanished into thin air. 1. St. Augustine Lighthouse, St. Augustine, Florida Over the years, Many facts have been established about the ghosts of the Lighthouse of St. Augustine, which is located on the Atlantic coast. When it comes to haunted places in Florida, this particular lighthouse is considered one of the most popular. The main reason for this is location. This structure is located in the so-called oldest city of the nation or ancient city. St. Augustine is a place with a vast and violent past. Due to the age of the city itself, Many historical buildings and places are surrounded by many ghost legends. Overall, the city is considered the most haunted of all of Florida's haunted locations. The lighthouse in St. Augustine is considered one of the tallest lighthouses located in the United States. It stands 165 feet above sea level and contains an amazing 219 steps that visitors must climb to reach the observation deck that oversees the ancient city. On the land on which the lighthouse stands, a marine facility has been built since the early 1500s. However, the current lighthouse has only been owned since October 15, 1874. Before this, the lighthouse that guided ships to the Atlantic Ocean was only 40 feet high, built of wood, contained only a lamp, and flew a large number of flags. To understand the facts about the hauntings associated with the St. Augustine Lighthouse, it is important to get an idea of the history of the site. By learning a bit about the area's history, you can better estimate and understand why this place is considered one of the most haunted places in Florida. Although the current lighthouse was completed in 1874, actual construction began in 1871. Shortly after the completion of the lighthouse, Builders began work on the construction of a house that would serve as a residence for the keepers of the light and their families. It has been designed to accommodate up to three separate families. This building was designed using Victorian architecture and was completed in 1876. Typically, the main custodian oversees the structure and operations, and this custodian has up to two additional assistants to help with his duties. In 1955, there was no need for light guides, only lamplighters were required. These people did not live in the territory. The ocean is often associated with many tragedies. This is especially true of the Atlantic Ocean. Tropical storms and hurricanes over the years have caused many ships and liners to sink and many to die. In addition to this, many ships were unable to withstand the harsh waves and currents in open waters. As a result, many watercraft collapsed under pressure and sank into the dark depths of the Atlantic Ocean. One of the ghostly facts associated with the St. Augustine Lighthouse is that throughout history, it seemed that the light emitted by the tower attracted not only the living, but also the souls of those who perished at sea. For over 150 years, many ghost stories have been told about these lost souls by those who worked and lived around the St. Augustine Lighthouse. These stories have made it one of the most visited places in Florida. The following story, related to this haunted lighthouse in Florida, tells of a little girl dressed in clothes appropriate to the era of the early 20th century. When investigating deaths that occurred in the late 1900s, it was discovered that a little girl had been killed by a train that at that time often ran near the lighthouse grounds. 
The documentation regarding this child's death is not at all specific enough to give an established age, but people who have claimed to have seen her spirit say she looks like she is between 10 and 11 years old. Many witnesses to this real ghost claim that she was often seen walking around the building in which the keepers of the light lived, as well as the tower itself right behind the bushes. Paranormal investigators believe that this young girl may be a residual ghost or a record of past events that happened during her lifetime. It is believed that it is somehow connected with the lighthouse of St. Augustine. While researching the haunted facts related to this haunted lighthouse, there is another story related to children. Although there are many different versions of the story, the most basic story is that in the 1870s, when the current lighthouse was being built, two of the light guide's children, as well as another girl, who could have been a daughter, a servant, or a slave, were playing on a handcar in which building materials were brought from ships in the ocean. Unfortunately, the car crashed into the stormy ocean. It is believed that the servant child was able to successfully escape the raging sea, but that the other two girls were not successful and died. Since then, there have been many reports of a little girl lingering in and around the lightkeeper's house, as well as in the tower itself. Today, many still claim to have seen this young girl looking out of the window of the keepers of the light. While stories of child spirits are the most commonly cited ghost facts associated with St. Augustine Lighthouse, several other spirits are also thought to haunt the grounds. One story involves a man who lost a large fortune in the stock market crash that occurred in 1929. It is believed that he was so shaken by the financial loss that he committed suicide by hanging himself here. However, it is important to understand that no documentation supports this claim. 2. The Sally House, Atchison, Kansas Known for its paranormal phenomena, Sally's house is located in Kansas. In appearance, this is the most ordinary house, of which there are thousands, but the inhabitants of this house are very dangerous. We can say that they protect him. As soon as someone enters there, inexplicable attacks begin. Eyewitnesses say that more than once they noticed ghosts in it, and objects flew around the house. Someone heard the voices of animals and people coming from the house. And for those who live in the neighborhood, from time to time, mysterious wounds, scratches, burns, and cuts appear on the body. Locals believe that strange events in this house began to occur after the death of a little girl who died due to a medical error at the beginning of the last century. The doctor's name was Charles Finn. He performed a futile operation, as a result of which the girl was gone. According to legend, the dead girl remembers what the doctor did, and to this day takes revenge on all men who enter this house. The public learned about the De Sally house from the spouses who lived in this house. The couple talked about the terrible things happening in the room of their young child. The family said that in the nursery, the lights constantly turned on for no reason, and the toys climbed off the shelves and sat in a circle in the center of the room. One of the famous psychics heard about the haunted house and wished to come there. Already at the entrance to the Sally house, the woman saw that a certain person was sitting at the window. When the stranger discovered that he had been noticed, he got up and went into the kitchen. The most interesting thing was that there was no one in the house. The psychic felt the negative energy in the house, but was unable to help the family get rid of the ghosts. Later, one of the popular television shows asked the family for permission to film a story about ghosts living in the house. After that, the poltergeists got even angrier. It was possible to capture horrific footage on film, where the father of the family scratches himself for almost 10 minutes and speaks in a voice that is not his own. After recovering, the man said that something was forcing him to do all these inexplicable things. And then the husband felt an obsessive desire to kill his wife. The family could not stay in this house for another minute. They decided to leave as soon as possible. Other ghosts living in the house. It turned out that the ghost of a little girl is not the only inhabitant of the house. Nobody knows exactly how many more ghosts there are. The father of the family admitted that he had seen Sally more than once. When he wanted to approach her, she was very frightened. The man also recalled seeing a young woman in the kitchen several times. 
She screamed at him and disappeared as soon as he tried to touch her. This young woman is believed to be the ghost of a relative of Dr. Finney who lived near Sally's house. Another well-known medium inspected the house in 2009. He stated that he saw the ghost of a doctor surrounded by a dark mass. The medium met in the house and the ghosts of two girls named Emily and Anna. They had someone else with them, whom they called the devil. Now no one lives in the Sally's house, but tourists from all over the world dream of breaking through there to see all these ghosts with their own eyes. 3. Franklin Castle, Cleveland, Ohio Franklin Castle in Cleveland has become a stronghold of numerous urban legends and one of the most famous haunted houses. Outwardly, this mansion even looks quite creepy, a gothic house with towers and balconies, a lot of forged details in the decoration, the presence of secret rooms and passages, and gargoyles became its highlight. This masterpiece of the gothic style was built by the German immigrant Tiedemann in the 60s of the last century. Starting as a simple grocer, Hans Tiedemann was able to grow into a successful banker. They still argue about his personality. Some tend to consider Hans a cruel monster, and others think that he, like the rest, is just a victim of nightmarish events. After entering Franklin Castle, not so much time passed before members of the Hans family began to die. The first victim was his daughter. According to urban legend, the girl was found hanged, although the official version is that she died of diabetes. Tiedemann's elderly mother soon followed her into the kingdom of the gloomy Hades, the god of death. If everything was clear with the death of the girl, she died of diabetes, then the reason for the death of the old lady has not yet been found out. Later, Hans lost three more children, and the cause of their death was also not solved by the police. However, now a shadow of suspicion has fallen on the owner of the Gothic mansion. From the many legends about this house, you can find out that Hans was accused of other deaths, the death of a servant, a mistress, his niece, wife. Hans Tiedemann died on his way back to Franklin Castle. Subsequent owners constantly found hidden passages and rooms in the house, tunnels dug underground. According to eyewitnesses, in the castle, you can see the ghost of the owner of the house and the lady in black. According to rumors, this is a murdered young servant. Hear the heart-rending cries of children and meet the ghost of Han's niece. There are claims that the objects in the mansion move by themselves and the doors and windows also live their own lives. All the families that owned the castle afterward tried to leave it as soon as possible and now the history of this house has become part of urban legends. 4. Snedeker House, Southington, Connecticut How it all began The Snedeker lived in New York. Alan, the head of the family, and his wife Carmen was engaged in raising children. In 1986, the eldest son, Philip, began to complain to his mother about pain in the left side of his jaw. Having visited the doctor, the woman heard a disappointing diagnosis her child had cancer of the immune system. The boy was prescribed treatment at a clinic located in Connecticut. Since there was a long distance from the house to the hospital, Philip's parents decided to rent an apartment there. Walking through Southington, Carmen saw a suitable ad. The price was reasonable and after talking with their spouse, the Snedekers rented the property. The night before leaving for Connecticut, the woman had a nightmare about their new abode. However, she did not attach any importance to this. On June 30th of the same year, the family moved into a rented residential building. Settlement in a new home. The family, consisting of a husband and wife, their four children, and two nieces, began to settle in an old mansion, the events in which served as an inspiration for the creation of the horror film The Haunting in Connecticut. The real story says that Alan repaired the dwelling and brought it to more or less normal condition. During working hours, the man was not in the city, as his activities were related to business trips. Carmen cooked, cleaned, and tidied up the rooms. The younger children went to kindergarten, and the older ones went to school. Life slowly began to stabilize. Philip, meanwhile, was undergoing therapy at a local hospital. Carmen was reluctant to go down to the basement because there was a creepy atmosphere. 
basement or crypt strange and frightening things began to happen to the new tenants after the snitikers discovered that their basement used to be a mortuary Carmen and Alan found tools for opening the bodies of the dead, deep cells with serial numbers built into the wall, equipment for transporting coffins, rubber tubes of various diameters, photographs of corpses, many barrels of heating oil, and bags with clothes of the deceased. Later, small graves were discovered in the backyard, which was also reflected in the movie The Haunting in Connecticut. Alan and Carmen turned to the real estate service, with the help of which a deal was made to rent a house. They complained that they were not informed about the presence of a funeral home in their house, but the realtor insisted that he told them about it. The controversial situation was never resolved, and the Snedekers had to put up with it. Meeting with the Inevitable The first contact with the dark forces occurred with Philip. First, he began to hear someone calling him, and then to see what was hidden from prying eyes during the day. The guy woke up from the fact that there were silhouettes of some men above him, they were breathing hoarsely and just looking at him. After strange sounds and hallucinations, he began to smell unpleasant odors and even feel like the true inhabitants of the house were touching him. He told Carmen everything, but she thought it was a side effect of chemotherapy. But having visited the doctor, the specialist ruled out such a possibility. Following Philip, his brothers, and sister began to tell their parents about mystical phenomena in the mansion. Only after Philip's friend complained to his parents about the terrible things in the neighbor's basement, the latter had to pay attention to it. Every night, the Snedeker children were increasingly attacked by mysterious creatures, after which the film The Haunting in Connecticut is named. Once Carmen read Philip's diary and was horrified at what strange things he wrote about. The boy changed every day. He became gloomy and withdrawn, and also began to pose a threat to all family members. The woman went to a doctor from psychiatry, and on the same day the nurses took Philip to the hospital. There he was in a straitjacket under the influence of medications. But before they took him away, the teenager managed to warn his mother that now the ghosts will switch to all the other Snedekers. Last Encounter Carmen regretted her act. She sat in the basement for a long time and waited for a meeting with those who disturbed Philip. Soon the spirits made themselves felt. While Alan was at work and the children were with their grandmother, Carmen stayed with her niece, Tammy. That night the ghosts attacked them. They tried to rape one of them and strangle the other with a shower curtain. As a result, the girl sat on the bed and read the Bible and the dark forces retreated. The next day, Paranormal investigators Ed and Lorraine Warren came to the Snedeker house. After examining the house, they decided that it was inhabited by phantoms. The reason for their appearance was that the funeral home employees who worked here committed repeated acts of necrophilia. Then the priests came to the mansion and performed a rite of purification from the restless souls. Truth or Fiction Ghosts in Connecticut no longer manifest themselves. Carmen greatly regretted that she sent her son to a psychiatric hospital from where he came out sometime later. The young man felt betrayed, he still had a grudge against his mother. It is noteworthy that when the Snedekers left the mansion, Philip went into remission, which ended with the retreat of cancer. The new owners of the house, by the way, lived there quietly and never encountered supernatural phenomena. And this became a reason to doubt the veracity of the story. Some called the Snedekers charlatans who tried to attract attention to themselves in this way. Others sympathized with them, believing that the house was cleared of evil spirits, so the new tenants did not encounter it. It seems that only the Snedekers know what has happened there. 5. The Surgeon's House The house was built in 1916 in Jerome, Arizona for the head of a group of surgeons. It was later converted into a hotel for nurses working at a nearby hospital. Since 1930, Dr. Artur Carlson lived here with his family. In 1953, when the local mine was closed, the house was sold to the owner of the mine. The further fate of the building was stormy. It passed from hand to hand and quickly deteriorated. Rumors of ghosts were not long in coming. So, in the house, 
they began to notice an elegant man dressed in an expensive suit and holding a medical bag in his hand. He walks around the house, enters the bedroom, changes clothes, and disappears. Another ghost of the house is a maid in a blue dress named Alice. And in one of the rooms, a couple in love can be seen dancing in the moonlight. 50. Berkeley Square Foggy London, where the sky is almost always overcast as if purposely created for gloomy stories about ghosts and poltergeists. We are used to spirits preferring old dark houses somewhere in remote areas, but this time it's different. House 50, Berkeley Square is located in one of the most fashionable areas of the capital and has been considered uninhabitable for 200 years, not at all because of leaking taps. Not so long ago, the cream of society lived in these places, lords, ladies, dukes, and other British elite. And today, only very wealthy Londoners can afford an apartment in Mayfair. Who would have thought that in a solid brick building, not much different from those in the neighborhood, evil forces live? At least that's what the locals think. In the beginning, there was a house. The story begins in 1740 with an architect named William Kent designing a four-story brick building that was home to politicians George Canning and Winston Churchill at various times. But the most memorable owner of the house was not they, but a man named Thomas Myers, or simply Mr. Myers. He was a member of Parliament and lived in the house in 1859. Ghosts of the House Of course, what old house in London would be without a ghost? This one is not. Legends vary, but one of the versions is repeated from legend to legend. In particular, they say that the attic room was occupied by the spirit of a young woman who once committed suicide within these walls. As if she was raped by her uncle, after which she jumped out of the window. This ghost is so creepy that it scares those who see it to death. It appears in the form of a brown fog, through which the white silhouette of a woman appears. According to another legend, the cause of the horror was the spirit of a young man, whom relatives locked in the same room in the attic, passing food to him through a hole in the door until he went crazy and died. The third version settles in the same room the ghost of a girl who was killed by a sadistic servant. Since 1859, according to other versions, since 1885, Thomas Myers, a member of parliament, settled there. He was rejected by his lover, after which he locked himself in the house, slowly losing his mind. He lived there for at least 10 years, never went outside, and brought himself to such a neglected state that he lost everything he had, including his mind. However, not much is known about him. In her autobiography, published in 1906, Lady Dorothy Neville, a distant relative of Mr. Myers, claimed that there were no ghosts in the house, but her ancestor had indeed gone mad. He spent the whole day in the house, awake mostly at night. He walked along the corridors, made strange sounds, and turned on the lights. Many mistook the activity of Mr. Myers for manifestations of a poltergeist. The whole story is nonsense, wrote Lady Neville. But not everyone can agree with her. Why else would so many people not be able to spend the night within the walls of this house? One drunk student. Fortune favors the desperate, but not at this time. A 20-year-old student, Sir Robert Warboys was young, hot, and brave. Once, sitting with friends in the Holborn Tavern in 1840, he boasted that nothing and no one in this world would be able to frighten him, and all stories about spirits were only inventions of cowards. Probably, a dispute broke out, as a result of which friends made a bet. To prove his courage, Warboys had to go and sleep alone at the famous 50, Berkeley Square. God only knows how tipsy students managed to get their landlord to let them in for the night. Either Warboys had money and connections so that the young sir's whims were treated with understanding, or the landlord himself was curious how the matter would end. However, the landlord set two conditions. First, Warboys will take a gun with him. Second, at the slightest sign of something strange, he would pull the cord that connected his room with the guest room. A bell was hung from the end of the cord so that the landlord knew exactly when to run to the rescue of the youth. Warboys took the gun and locked himself in a room on the second floor. The landlord remained in his room on the first. 
Not even 45 minutes had passed when he was awakened by the persistent ringing of bells, and almost immediately a shot rang out. The landlord ran up to the second floor and flung open the guest bedroom door, but it was too late. He found his lodger huddled in a corner, dead already. The barrel of his pistol was still smoking, and the bullet was lodged in the wall. Horror froze on the face of the unfortunate man. Two Drunk Sailors Nearly 50 years later, two drunken sailors Robert Martin and Edward Blunden of HMS Penelope ventured to repeat Warboy's challenge. Their ship was moored in London, and the sailors on the shore decided to relax. Drunk, they stumbled into the then-empty building number 50, climbed with difficulty to the second floor, the condition of the first floor left much to be desired, and collapsed to sleep. Blunden was a little soberer than his friend and immediately felt that there was something in the room beside them. Martin blamed everything on the musty air and suggested just opening the window to freshen up the room a bit. Both soon fell asleep, but an hour later Blunden woke up. It was about midnight. The creaking of door hinges caught his attention. Looking closer, Blunden was horrified to see something gray creeping in through the wide open door of the room, blocking the only escape route. Martin had also woken up by then. Suddenly, Blunden found a gun leaning against the wall next to the window. He tried to get it and it was a mistake. Fast, like a flash, a gray something attacked the sailor. A good shot by Lord Littleton. And if these two cases raised doubts, all participants in the events except for the gray something were seriously loaded, then the story that took place in 1872 15 years before the events with the sailors does not raise doubts about the reasonableness of its participant. Lord Littleton, a British aristocrat, lived in the house we already know, even in the same room. One day he saw something that he could not define. He was just getting ready for bed when a mysterious creature crawled into his room. Without panicking and keeping a cold mind, Littleton took a gun and fired one well-aimed shot. Littleton claimed to have shot the creature and even saw it fall, but no traces were found. Littleton said that it looked like a sticky liquid and made strange sounds when moving and something remotely resembled an octopus. Some believe that it was the octopus that the creature was, as if it somehow penetrated the house through underground channels. The version, of course, is shaky. End of horror. Octopus or not, after Mag's brothers bought the house in the 1930s and an antique shop opened in the house, all the terrible phenomena immediately stopped. Maybe real skeptics settled in the house. Or maybe it was because that very room was locked up, the owners forbade it to be used for any purpose, and it was impossible even to arrange a warehouse in it. Whaley House the ghosts of Whaley's house in San Diego are officially recognized as the most active in California. The reputation is well deserved. The flow of tourists here does not stop. No tour is complete without visiting this place. Everyone who has been to Whaley's house will tell their story of swinging chandeliers, footsteps, the smell of lavender perfume and burning tobacco, and flesh and blood figures dressed in 19th century clothing that comes and go. At least seven ghosts haunt the Whaley home, including a small terrier. With so many ghosts, the Queen Mary ship can only compete, perhaps. Or the great ghosts of Gettysburg. Perhaps this house was doomed from the very beginning because it was built in a place where a man was unjustly hanged. Who built the Whaley house? New York businessman Thomas Whaley moved to San Francisco in 1849 during the gold rush. Things were going uphill, but in 1851 his shop burned down. Whaley decided to move out of sleepy San Diego. And again, the man was successful, which allowed him to return to New York and marry his beloved, Anna. In 1855, the newlyweds returned to San Diego and settled in a new house that Whaley had built for them. What followed was a series of tragedies and triumphs, but mostly tragedies. First of all, the death of Whaley's eldest and favorite daughter, Anna, in 1888. She shot herself in the chest in desperation over her failed marriage. The father moved the girl from the storage room in the backyard, which is now the utility outbuilding, to the bedroom where the girl died in his arms. 
the inconsolable father vowed never to live in that house again. But in 1890, Thomas Whaley died at the age of 57, and his family moved back to San Diego. Whaley's last descendant died in 1953. For all the time in the house, six family members and a neighbor's child died, who accidentally strangling on a low-hanging clothesline. How it all started. This whole story began with a violent death, which was an example of harsh justice. Yankee Jim Robinson, a petty criminal and pirate, was caught stealing a rowboat in San Diego Bay. While his henchmen received only a year each, Robinson was hanged for his crime. The average height of a person in the district then was 164 centimeters, and Robinson was 193 centimeters tall, and he was executed on a gallows a little higher than himself. As a result, instant death did not follow, and the man was left to spin and gasp, almost on tiptoe, for 45 minutes, after which he was declared dead. Thomas Whaley, while still at the stage of building a house, both heard and saw ghosts more than once. Whaley also knew about the execution of the Yankee, but did not believe in superstitious nonsense. Over the years, the Whaley family changed their minds. What the Whaley's house staff say. Deborah, fake name, the woman asked not to be named, worked as a volunteer guide at Whaley's home for two years. During this time, what only she had not seen. A casual tourist is unlikely to see ghosts in all their glory. I heard a male voice was clearing his throat as I changed, she says. Thomas Whaley himself often materializes on the top step of the stairs leading to the master bedroom. Visitors often smell the smoke from his cigar and hear his baritone laugh echoing throughout the house. Thomas's wife Anna also makes frequent appearances. She is described as a beautiful and graceful woman dressed in chintz dresses. The floral scent of Anna's perfume is in the air and her melodious voice is accompanied by eerie distant piano sounds. Who is not loved by the ghosts of Whaley's house? The ghost residents of Whaley's house apparently can't stand naysayers. There was one atheist who didn't believe in such things and spoke loudly about it, Deborah recalls. He was the chief of police. And here the man was standing in the corridor, talking with another guide when suddenly he smelled a puff of cigar smoke in his face. The guide felt it too. The policeman rushed to the door and stood on the porch, panting, but was immediately overwhelmed by another blow of the ghostly smell. The man just ran away and never came back. I asked if anyone had seen smoke and if there could be any explanation for this episode. Well, it was strange, says Deborah. There was no smoke, just a strong smell. One visitor recalled it this way. We all felt it. Deborah left me alone on the second floor for about 20 minutes and I did smell the famous lavender scent that legend says is from Anna Whaley's perfume, but I didn't see any movement, I didn't hear voices, and I didn't feel the ghostly touch on my face. Other visitors have experienced this more than once. What's the scariest thing about Whaley's house? One of the creepiest and most recurring events in the Whaley household involves the hanging of Jim the Yankee. I think he has a sense of humor, says Deborah. The old gallows were installed in the place of the current staircase. And visitors going up or down the stairs often end up with a red mark around their necks. It doesn't hurt, and most people don't even notice until someone else points it out to them. One girl ran out of the house in a panic after her boyfriend noticed a thin red line on her neck. What is the scariest thing Deborah has seen or heard at the Whaley house? I was downstairs when I heard a terrible, blood-curdling scream. It looked like someone was falling down the stairs. I ran to ask the people upstairs if they heard it, and yes, everyone heard it, but they thought it happened downstairs. One of the employees, who was in a room next to the hallway, said he heard a nasty voice say, get out. It didn't happen again. How Ghosts Guard the House during Thanksgiving week in 2004, someone tried to break into Whaley's house in the dead of night. One of the back doors was smashed to the ground, but the motion sensors didn't detect any activity and nothing in the house was touched. That is, someone broke the door, but the matter did not go beyond that. 
For several days afterward, visitors and employees experienced cold in the room until a new door was installed. This is exactly the room where Anna died in her father's arms. No one could understand what exactly scared off the vandals or potential robbers. But the fact remains. Who needs the latest electronic surveillance technology when ghosts guard the Whaley House 24 hours a day, 7 days a week? When are the ghosts of Whaley's house most active? If we assume that ghosts are some kind of biorhythm from the outside, then their activity can be called undulating. For some reason, ghosts appear more often during the holiday season, from Thanksgiving to New Year's. This happens both during the day and at night. Whaley House, in addition to regular daytime hours, is open from 9 p.m. to midnight during the week leading up to All Saints Day. You can also get acquainted with the ghosts of the Whaley House from 7 to 10 p.m. in the summer. Where is Jim Robinson buried? A short walk south along San Diego Avenue is El Campo Santo Cemetery. It was founded in 1849 and served as the old city's Catholic burial site until around 1890. Near the entrance is the grave of Yankee Jim. It is hard not to notice, there is also a pointer. Ram and Ghost Hotel in England. One of the legends says that in the distant year 940, a certain Edric received part of the land of the English county of Gloucestershire, where he began the construction of a city near Topa Hill. The new city grew fairly quickly, but until 1139 there was not a single church there. Then they built an abbey in it and set about building a large church, but it turned out that such a building needed a large number of masons. Therefore, in 1145, a guest yard was built, which received the name Ram, and accommodated the builders. However, there were rumors that the hired workers were treated there like slaves, so the losses were considerable, and new ones were simply brought in to replace the dead masons. After the completion of the construction of the Church of St. Mary, all the masons were evicted. The building was put in order, and the local bishop was placed in it, by the way, inspiring fear rather than reverence. The bishop was considered a famous fighter against witches, but it was said that in fact, he was in the power of dark forces. Therefore, in those days, the Ram Hotel was known as a place of terrible rituals. For many centuries, the hotel belonged to the church, and what happened there was not known to anyone, but people always bypassed this place. At the end of the 19th century, a tavern was set up in this building, but it went bankrupt because no one wanted to drink or dine in this place. And only in 1930 Ramen became a private property and a hotel was opened on this site, and in 1968 John Humphrey bought it and took up its restoration and development. Today it is a full-fledged hotel with several rooms, open to everyone. In addition, in the process of repair work, skeletons and other terrible finds were found in the walls. Incomprehensible dark figures are wandering around the hotel, the clock here is constantly malfunctioning, and the air temperature from time to time unexpectedly drops. The hotel has now gained popularity among all kinds of ghost hunters and thrill seekers. The guests tell how they physically felt the evil spirits of this place, which are several here at once. Almost all visitors also feel the oppressive atmosphere, being in this place, or incomprehensible and unpleasant odors. They tried to clean this place repeatedly and with the help of the clergy, but when they tried to free the buildings from evil spirits, they were immediately driven out by these terrifying evil forces. The Bishop of Gloucester called this guest yard the most sinister place where he had the misfortune to be. Eyewitnesses share stories about some scratching sounds in the bar and even about the ghost of a woman. In one of the rooms, the ghost of a cavalier sometimes appears, and when the chimney was dismantled in it, satanic and other magical artifacts were discovered. Worst Reputation with the Bishop's Room Once, all eight people who spent the night in this room were subjected to the rite of exorcism, and a little girl saw the ghost of a medieval monk there at night. Another visitor in the kitchen of the hotel saw the ghost of a woman emerging from under the floor. After some time, the floor was dismantled and a skeleton and ancient knives were found there. Expert research showed that they were ritual victims. It doesn't matter whether a person believes in the existence of ghosts or not, it is impossible to find anyone who would not feel uncomfortable when visiting the Ram and Hotel. 
This place remains one of the most cursed house in England, which is helped not only by history, but also by the sinister atmosphere of this place. Borgvatnet Vicarage, Sweden. Considered one of Sweden's most haunted places. This vicarage once even attracted a ghost casting priest. This ancient building, built in 1876, served as the residence of the priests of the local church. All was peaceful and quiet until 1927, when a local vicar reported some strange activity around his house, including strange voices and unholy dreams. Stories of paranormal events continued into the following decades. Every priest and new family reported haunted incidents. In 1930, Vicar Rudolf Tangden saw an old woman in gray appear in one of the rooms. He followed her as she left, but she disappeared before his eyes. Rudolf's successor, Otto Lindgren, experienced several paranormal experiences while living in a rectory in the 1940s, including unexplained noises and objects moving by themselves. One night, the woman who was in the vicarage woke up to find three elderly women sitting on the couch in her room, staring at her in the dark. She turned on the light and the three ghosts were still there, but they seemed blurry in the light. In another case where the priest brought a rocking chair with him when he moved into the priest's house, the ghosts liked it. No one was allowed to sit on a chair for a long period without being thrown out of it by an invisible force, and the chair would often rock on its own. Who these ghosts were during their lifetime and why they live in the house is unknown, but there are suggestions that these are the souls of former vicars. There are also stories of a maid who killed her child and buried the body in the backyard, and there are stories of a priest named Perhandland who lost his wife in childbirth. The woman died giving birth to 11 children and, on the advice of the residents, the priest buried her near the house. However, it is believed that he dug up her body and took it with him when he left. The Pirate's House, Savannah, United States. Have you heard of Captain Flint? Heard, you answer. He was the most bloodthirsty pirate of the sailors. Blackbeard was a child compared to Flint. The Spaniards were so afraid of him that I will tell you, I was sometimes proud that he was an Englishman. John Trelawney answered the same question in Robert Louis Stevenson's adventure novel, Treasure Island. Robert Louis Stevenson based his characters in Treasure Island on real people and infamous pirates. The infamous Flint was no exception. Although Treasure Island was first published in 1883, Stevenson's book describes events that took place 150 years earlier. It is known that when Stevenson was in the city of Savannah, he went into a tavern and heard the story of a drunkard about a pirate captain who died in one of the rooms of the hotel, asking for more rum. Bring the rum, Derby, were Captain Flint's last words to Darby McGraw. It is possible that in the late 1870s, Stevenson also heard that the ghost of this scoundrel still haunted the tavern. The pirate's insistence on following the rules even in death may have inspired Stevenson to write of Flint. Dead? Yes, I'm sure he's dead, but if a ghost appears, it'll be Flint. This infamous eatery still exists today, although you won't see any more pirates there except for one captain's ghost. A pirate who still lives in the building. The locals call him Flint's ghost because they don't know his real name. Today, the tavern is an expensive restaurant aptly named the Pirate's House. The history of the Pirate's House begins with the founding of the city of Savannah in 1733 when colonists arrived from England. A tent city was built and a large experimental garden was planted. Botanists brought grape seedlings, seeds, flowers, and herbs from all over the world for the 10-acre plot of land. The colonists needed to know what would grow in the area and what would not. High hopes were placed on grapes for winemaking and mulberries for silk cultivation. Nothing grew in that climate and soil, but they found that peach trees grew quite well there. After 20 years, when cultivation periods were established in the state of Georgia, the city of Savannah began to turn into a beautiful seaport city and large gardens were no longer needed. The Pirate's House was originally built by a sailor in 1754. It was made of wooden beams connected with wooden nails, in the same way that sailors built ships. The structure contrasts with the well-built colonial era houses in the city center. The Pirate House was a dangerous place full of cutthroat pirates and scoundrels. 
Sailors, when they came from all the ports of the world, stopped there for the sake of grog and rum, except for the pirate Jean-Pierre Lafitte, who married a woman from the same district and lived at a different time. It is difficult to name names. Too many famous pirates visited this old tavern. What is the life of a pirate, you ask? Robert Edgerly, who has lived in Savannah since birth and is an expert on pirates, also leads tours called Pirate Walks, said. Pirates didn't live long, but they didn't care. Compared to the life of ordinary sailors, these guys lived perfectly. They did not care if they were hanged at the age of 40, as they saw and experienced much more in their lives than any city centenarians. Edgerly explained how infamous pirates such as Blackbeard, Calico Jack, and Steed Bonnet had all been in the city of Savannah, but several decades earlier before the British settled there and long before the pirate house became a harsh and cruel eatery of sailors. The wine cellar of the pirate house had a tunnel connecting the building to the Savannah River at a tipsy, or sometimes drugged, sailor could leave the diner and wake up the next day on an unknown ship at sea. Pirate captains had a reputation for capturing ship crews if they required manpower. Edgerly said, many men were needed for ships at sea, otherwise the ships were not seaworthy. If the ship was loaded and ready to sail and there were not enough men on the ship, the sailors were taken by force. In those days you didn't go alone to the seaport because of that. They didn't look at the old, they didn't look at the lame, they looked at the young, healthy guys. And local authorities turned a blind eye to this if they were not married, had no children, or were from poor families. They turned a blind eye to it because of the trade. Edgerly explained that sailors forced onto the ship were not allowed to leave the ship when it was in various seaports around the world for fear that they would escape. But power moves were not the only way to capture a sailor. Edgerly said, if a gang of strong men could not find anyone, then they went to a place that is now called the Pirate's House and found a sailor who was healthy in body, who already knew what it was, who had had a little grog or whom they quickly led out of his condition with a blow to the head. We know that the basement where the captain's quarters were located, Cypress Building Number 1750, is a wine cellar. They went down there, and during the day there were men tied and chained to casks of rum, and then at night they dragged the casks through the tunnels and sent them out to sea. With kidnapped sailors, brutal pirates drinking themselves to death, and over 250 years of American history, Pirate House has more than just ghost stories. Greg Prophet arrived in the city of Savannah in April 1990, became a believer, and a few years later began to conduct excursions with Creepy Crow. He and his tourists have many stories about the appearance of ghosts in the Pirate House. Prophet said, I started giving tours at Pirate House. There was a small restaurant upstairs called Hannah's East. I remember one night, I had a lot of customers there, and I go around the tables and tell them that in a few minutes, we are leaving, and the glasses can be taken with us. There were two sisters from Atlanta, and their glasses were almost empty. They were going to walk up to the bar, order another one, and then leave. Suddenly, when I was about to leave, one of the women screamed. I turned and saw that her glass was filled to the top with Spanish moss. She was absolutely thrilled. On another occasion, Prophet was talking to a young couple from Atlanta at the beginning of a tour at the Pirate House Bar. Prophet said, they asked me about ghosts. Directly across from us at the cash register on the other side of the bar was a mass of glasses in the shape of a pyramid. They didn't fall, they exploded. Literally, the exploded glass was scattered everywhere. Prophet also does charity work in the city of Savannah. So, one time it was a challenge to friends that led him to stay overnight in the dining room of the captain's room, the most haunted place in the restaurant of Tony Cross, a Leukemia Society fundraiser. Prophet said he would accept the challenge if Cross joined him. This idea turned into a charity event where people sponsored two men on a haunted adventure. Prophet and Cross received over $6,000, but the haunted encounter exceeded their expectations. Prophet said, it was really strange, we heard a lot of noise. We were alone in the building and had to go to bed in the same room, but I just wandered around, I couldn't help it, it was delightfully. We kept hearing footsteps and knocking on the walls and doors. We looked around, but found nothing. Tony was there to check on me. He didn't believe in ghosts. 
He is British. At a quarter to one, he read from Treasure Island, Derby, bring me some more rum. He added a tone as if he were reading to a crowd of people. I brought Jamaican rum because, in the book, Flint's last words were, bring the rum, Derby. I brought rum and three glasses. I had one glass, Tony had the second, and the third was where one of us would have had to stand up to get close to him. At a quarter to one, when he read from the book, Derby, bring me more rum, that glass that neither of us reached simply disappeared along with the rum that was in it. We saw him disappear. Prophet is not the only eyewitness to the supernatural phenomena in the pirate's house. Robert Edgerly said, I know people who have seen a ghost, a big fat guy sitting at a table. Since the house of pirates has existed for a long time, generations of people work there. I've talked to trustworthy people, I mean the ones who don't think up, who have seen a ghost. The restaurant used to have 20 canteens, but now some of it is owned by another restaurant. Now there are 14 dining rooms, and the reason for this is the fact that some rooms are old living rooms, bedrooms of adjacent houses. I have been told by at least three employees in 20 years that they walked around the premises at night, passed by the room, looked into it, and saw a guy there at the table. They came back and looked again, and he looked at them. They were scared to death, they went after someone, and they came back, but there was no one there. People saw the old captain of the ship sitting there. When Greg Prophet shared some of his haunting experiences with author Francis Kerman at the Pirate's House Bar, both experienced the horrifying feeling of the author typing notes into her travel computer. Prophet said, as soon as we started talking about the ghost, some strange things began to happen to the computer. Numbers, letters, and symbols began to appear on the monitor. It was impossible to understand what it was. The buttons began to be pressed by themselves, and it froze. Francis restarted the computer, and this time something like words appeared on the monitor. They appeared somehow together, to hate, to die. The third time, it seemed to me that these were threats in my direction that I should shut up and do nothing, otherwise something bad would happen to me. The ghost of Flint, in all his menacing glory, still roams the pirate house. Other eyewitnesses heard the phantoms pleas for rum. Some saw the captain himself. If you go there, buy him some rum or grog in a friendly way, and don't let the guards lead you down, you don't want to wake up at seed being forced to work for Captain Flint. The Fairmont Banff Springs Hotel in Canada. The Fairmont Banff Springs Hotel is one of the most popular locations in Canada, but its fame is due not only to the quality of service and good location, but also to the mass of mystical stories about secret rooms, ghosts, and missing tourists. The Fairmont Banff Springs Hotel, located in the Canadian province of Alberta, opened its doors to tourists in 1888. Its guests were not only ordinary people who wanted to enjoy the breathtaking views that opened from the windows of the hotel, but also celebrities such as Marilyn Monroe and Winston Churchill, as well as members of the royal families. In 1939, King George VI and Elizabeth Bowes Lyon arrived at the hotel as part of a tour of Canada. However, Fairmont Banff Springs Hotel gained its fame not thanks to the famous guests who lived in it. It is believed that the walls of the hotel hide many secrets and dark secrets, and its rooms are teeming with ghosts. Construction of the Fairmont Banff Springs Hotel began in the 1880s, located in the picturesque town of Banff in the southern Rocky Mountains of Canada. The hotel was to become one of the best in the country. However, already at the construction stage, the first oddities began to occur the team involved in the creation of the hotel made a serious mistake, as a result of which one of the rooms was built without a single window. When the builders realized their mistake, for some reason they decided not to report it to the hotel owners and simply walled up the defective room. Amazingly, this secret remained undisclosed for a long time only during a major fire in 1926, the hotel staff discovered a walled room without windows on the eighth floor of the building, which was later turned into a storage room. However, according to eyewitnesses, this room for some reason instilled fear in everyone who entered it, and therefore it was used extremely rarely. However, the walled room is far from the only secret of the creepy hotel. Curse number 873. 
The largest number of stories is associated with room 873, located on the 8th floor of the hotel. According to some reports, the room, walled up by the builders, was not turned into a storage room but was converted into a room at number 873, but exact information about this has not been preserved. For many years, guests of the room have complained that this particular room is inhabited by spirits that are by no means friendly. So, one of the tourists said that at night an invisible entity pulled out a pillow from under his head, and another said that he was awakened by an ominous laugh and then thrown out of bed. At the same time, almost all the guests of room 873 spoke about the prints of children's hands on the mirror and walls, which appeared as suddenly as they disappeared. It is noteworthy that the hotel staff has repeatedly seen traces of small hands that could not be erased by any detergent the prints disappeared on their own and then reappeared, instilling real horror in those who witnessed this action. According to legend, one day a family of three moved into room 873, a couple and their little daughter. After a few days of staying at the hotel, they suddenly disappeared, after which the Fairmont Banff Springs hotel staff decided to go to their room and check if everything was in order. When the administrator and the maids opened the door of the room, they were horrified all family members, including the child, were dead. According to one version, the guests were killed by an unknown criminal. According to another, the wife and child died at the hands of the head of the family, who suddenly lost his mind killed his wife and daughter, and then committed suicide. Some researchers believe that this story formed the basis of Stephen King's famous novel The Shining. Subsequently, the cursed room was permanently closed, and its door was walled up. Currently, it does not even appear in the plans of the building, but even today, some tourists see the family who died in room 873 in the corridors of the eighth floor of the building. Ghosts of Former Hotel Employees the friendliest ghost of the Fairmont Banff Springs Hotel is the messenger Sam McCauley, who died in 1975. Hotel guests have repeatedly seen a smiling man who opened the door for them, helped them get into the room if they lost the key, and even woke them up in the morning. According to the guests, the ghost looked like a living person. He was dressed in a plaid shirt, the one in which he was at the time of death, polite and extremely helpful, and therefore no one had any idea that it was a ghost. The hotel staff recalls that during his lifetime, Sam literally idolized his work. He often worked overtime, replaced sick employees on his days off, and did not refuse to take on additional workloads. Probably, even after his death, he continued to treat his work with great love and did not want to leave the walls of the hotel. In addition, guests of the Fairmont Banff Springs Hotel have also spoken about the ghost of the bartender who urged them to go to bed if they drank too much alcohol, as well as the spirit of the gardener who floated on the hotel grounds with garden tools in his hands. Dead Bride Another ghost of the hotel is the bride who died on her wedding day, whose soul remained forever within the walls of the building. Fairmont Banff Springs Hotel was a favorite place for wedding ceremonies for 133 years of its existence. The hotel has seen many happy newlyweds, but the story of the deceased bride left a dark stain on its reputation. In the 1930s, another young couple decided to celebrate their wedding in a picturesque Canadian hotel on the appointed day. The guests gathered in the luxurious lobby of the Fairmont Banff Springs Hotel and, together with the groom, began to wait for the appearance of the bride, who was supposed to go down the stairs, decorated with hundreds of candles. Everything went according to plan, when suddenly the hem of the bride's wedding dress caught on one of the candles, as a result of which the outfit instantly broke out. Panic, the girl began to make sudden movements, trying to bring down the flames. She stumbled and, losing her balance, fell down the stairs and broke her neck. The doctors who arrived at the scene reported that her death was instantaneous. The tragedy that happened that day shocked not only the guests of the wedding, but also all the inhabitants of the province of Alberta. People began to ascribe the status of a cursed Fairmont Banff Springs Hotel and tried to avoid it at all costs, and those who still decided to check into the hotel began to talk about seeing the ghost of the deceased bride. According to legends, her spirit, dressed in a wedding dress, loves to walk around the hotel lobby, but most often it can be seen on the very stairs in the evenings. The bride goes down, 
stopping at the place where her dress caught fire and freezes in anticipation. Lady in Red and the Missing Guests Another terrible legend of the hotel is associated with the Lady in Red in 1944. A terrible car accident occurred near the Fairmont Banff Springs Hotel as a result of which a young girl died. It is believed that everything happened so quickly that her soul did not have time to realize what happened and now wanders around the hotel. Unlike other ghosts, the Lady in Red is a vicious and aggressive ghost. Hotel guests said that in the evening she wanders in the garden and makes terrible sounds, scaring guests, and besides, she likes to attack tourists in the elevator, suddenly emerging from the hatch. There is also a legend that in the last century guests regularly disappeared at the hotel. According to the staff, more than 100 guests of the Fairmont Banff Springs Hotel who settled and disappeared without a trace sometime after they arrived at the hotel. However, the management, wanting to hide the fact of missing people, ignored incidents by issuing eviction papers. However, at the moment there is no data that could confirm the version of the disappearance of tourists. Although today the Fairmont Banff Springs Hotel positions itself as a luxury hotel for a luxurious holiday in the mountains, most tourists continue to arrive in the hope of meeting famous ghosts. You can find a huge number of mystical stories on the web related to one of the most sinister locations in Canada. Of course, their authenticity cannot be verified, but paranormal hunters continue to explore the hotel in search of an answer to the main question, are ghosts living in its walls? Hotel Del Coronado Hotel Del Coronado, located in the Californian town of San Diego, is famous not only for its unusual architecture, bright spacious rooms, and proximity to the cleanest sandy ocean beaches, but also for paranormal phenomena. The construction of the California Hotel Del Coronado began in 1887, and a year later it opened its doors for the first time to respectable guests who want to have a great rest on the coast. On its beach, the original wooden buildings, decorated in the Victorian style, are still preserved. Now the Del Coronado Hotel has bars and restaurants and luxuriously decorated banquet halls. On its territory there are outdoor pools with clear bluish water and the interiors of unusual rooms are designed in the ocean style with unforgettable views of the Pacific Ocean open from the balconies of many rooms. But vacationers in this chic place often encounter manifestations of the other world, as if someone from the dark world is trying to infiltrate the bright world of space filled with sunlight. Tourists often meet a ghost with a female silhouette. Mysterious events and meetings with a ghost in a woman's dress at the Del Coronado Hotel began already in 1892 when a mysterious murder took place in a luxurious American hotel. The hotel had been operating for only four years when on November 24th, 1892, another guest settled in it, a beautiful young woman named Kate Morgan. Kate was the wife of Tom Morgan. In the late 1800s, the Morgan couple traveled a lot around the country and earned their living through numerous train scams. In November 1892, Kate discovered that she was pregnant. She decided to stop her criminal activities and settle down somewhere. Tom didn't want to change anything. The couple argued on the train on the way to San Diego. The husband got off in Los Angeles. However, even before the quarrel, the couple agreed to celebrate Thanksgiving together at a San Diego hotel. Kate is staying at the Del Coronado Hotel under the name Lottie Anderson Bernard. But on Thanksgiving Day, Tom never showed up. During her stay at the hotel, the woman often complained of feeling unwell and the hotel staff noted that she was very pale. It is now believed that perhaps Kate took a large dose of quinine in an attempt to get rid of the unwanted child on her own. It is known that she had a gun with her. There was no doubt that Morgan was emaciated and so when her body was found on November 29th on the steps of the stairs leading to the beach with a bullet hole in her temple and a gun nearby, the incident immediately ruled a suicide. However, already in 1990, Alan May, a lawyer specializing in murders, published the book The Legend of Kate Morgan, The Search for the Ghost of the Hotel Del Coronado. He studied the investigative file and concluded that Kate did not commit suicide, but was killed. Rather, May claims that she was killed by her husband. The bullet removed from the body did not match the caliber of her gun, 
and the position in which the corpse lay, according to the lawyer, is completely atypical for a case of suicide. In the hotel, Kate stayed in room 302, now it is room 3312. But even in room 3502, where the hotel maid lived, very strange things sometimes happen too. In both rooms there are, for example, inexplicable problems with electrical equipment, for example, the lights suddenly go out. Periodically, a cold breeze runs through both rooms. Employees claim that they saw how things move as if they were taken by invisible hands. Those guests who dare to stay in these rooms complain of a state of depression and say that the curtains fluctuate even when the windows are closed. Others speak of unintelligible whispers coming from nowhere. Kate's ghost was also seen descending the stairs of the hotel and standing on the windows. According to Alan May, the hotel's electrician assured him that the light above the stairs where Kate died would never work properly. The light bulb there is constantly changed, but it immediately burns out. May also claimed that when he stayed in one of the ill-fated rooms, the face of a young woman appeared on the screen of the switched-off TV. Two employees of the hotel also reported the same phenomenon. Room 3502 has its history. The maid who lived there was a friend of Kate's. The day after Kate's funeral, the woman disappeared. There is a version that Tom Morgan killed her, like his wife. And the hotel staff secretly buried the body so that the hotel would not lose all the guests. Now the Hotel Del Coronado is an architectural monument, and despite the ghost wandering in the night along its corridors, it attracts a large number of guests who are not afraid to come face to face with the manifestation of the other world. Madonna and the Prince of Wales, American presidents, and the long-dead comedian Charlie Chaplin rested here, enjoying views of the Pacific Ocean and excellent service. On the contrary, the ghost attracts even more attention to the Del Coronado Hotel. The female silhouette in a black translucent dress is a local landmark, a kind of hallmark of an unusual Californian hotel. To see the ghost, and if possible, to photograph it, Many hotel guests strive to uncover the secret that has attracted and at the same time frightened for hundreds of years. By the way, everything that happens in the hotel was described by parapsychologist Christopher Chacon. These stories inspired Stephen King to write the story 1408. Castle Hotel Balagali. Today Balagali is a well-known three-star hotel. It should be noted that in the 1950s a hotel was attached to the castle building. The castle was originally built by James Shaw, a native of Greenock, Scotland, who came to Northern Ireland in 1613. Shaw built the castle in 1625. Shortly after construction was completed, Shaw married Lady Isabel. According to local legend, during the early years of their marriage, Lady Isabel Shaw gave birth to a daughter. Her husband was so upset by the fact that he had no male heir that he locked his wife in a tiny castle tower overlooking the sea. And then, in the legend, there are disagreements either in despair from separation from her daughter and in an attempt to get out of the castle, Lady Shaw fell out of the window, or on the orders of her cruel husband, she was thrown down the stairs. Logically, the first version is rather strange. If James Shaw wanted an heir, then they might try again. However, the rumors that circulated at that time said that Lady Shaw had a lover and her daughter was from an unknown person. When James found out about this, he was furious and locked his wife in the tower. Nowadays, the spirit of Lady Isabel Shaw appears in the old part of the castle, especially in the so-called ghost room. Rumor has it, however, that the unfortunate woman is not the only ghost in this hotel. Olga Henry, the hotel's director, had been with Balagali since January 2003, and although she is from Northern Ireland, she didn't hear any ghost stories until she started working at the castle. She quickly became aware of the ghosts of Balagali. Henry said, I am kind of skeptical about everything supernatural and ghosts. But the more I stay and work here, the more I think this hotel has something. In the old honor of the hotel, in the castle section, there are four guest rooms located under the ghost room. Some people specifically book rooms in the castle section, and staying in these rooms exceeds all their expectations. 
Henry told about one of her visitors who stayed in the old section of the castle while in town on business. She explained, he stayed in one of the rooms of the tower. At home, he had four children. At midnight he dreamed that he was at home, he was lying on his stomach in bed, as if one of his children put his hands on his back then he woke up and realized where he was. He said that he heard the child running around the room and laughing. Then he came to the reception in just his shorts and said, get me out of the castle. The castle section also houses two private dining rooms, one called the dungeon and the other room 1625. The dungeon has an antique stone floor, a large fireplace, and pebbly plaster walls. It was in the dungeon in December 2003 that Henry experienced something special. Henry told how a group of directors was going to stay at the hotel and have dinner in the dungeon. We prepared the room the day before they arrived. I made sure the glasses were shiny and the candelabra was in order and everything looked festive. After cooking, we froze the room. The next day, while the arrivals were checking in, I decided to go and open the dungeon in case they wanted to take a look at the place where they were to have dinner. When I opened the dungeon, the table was a complete mess. Nothing, except for the glasses that lay in a circle on the table, was touched. All linen napkins were unrolled and partly scattered on the table. In the center of the table lay a round mirror in which stood candelabra, everything was covered, including glasses, with a layer of dust. It was not the kind of dust that can be wiped off, it was like some kind of plaque. But it was nowhere else in the room, neither on the floor nor on any other surface in the room, only on the table. My hair stood on end because I thought, was there another key to this room besides mine? And even under such circumstances, I could not find an explanation for this. Even though the old part of the castle is the most actively haunted, they appeared throughout the hotel. Henry told about the mediums who came to Balagali Castle and told that on some evenings there might be more spirits in the hotel than guests. The usual tales speak of the sounds of children laughing at play, the rustling of silk dresses when no one is around, and the water in the shower turning on by itself and flooding the rooms below. There are many reports of ghosts knocking on room doors throughout the hotel. Is it ghosts or people jokes, it is not clear, but when visitors open the doors, they do not find anyone in the corridor. The spirit of Lady Isabel Shaw resides exclusively in the old section of the castle, especially in the ghost room. The week before Christmas 1998, Kim Lenigan, a reporter for the BBC's Good Morning Ulster radio program, was recording a series of jokes for Halloween. She decided to spend the night in the ghost room of Balagali Castle as one of the jokes. I spoke to Lenigan in her office on the BBC in Belfast about that night at the Balagali that had exceeded all her expectations. Lenigan said, we thought it would be funny. We decided, let's spend a normal night in a creepy house. Lingahan arrived at Balagali Castle on a dark, windy, cold October evening. She arranged to meet a medium there, who gave only her first name, Sally. Sally didn't want to be on the news, she came here just to get in touch with the spirit. Like the other mediums, Sally told the hotel director that several spirits haunted the hotel. Lenigam and Sally went up to the cold, drafty ghost room, and Sally began to meditate for making contact with one of the ghosts of Balagali Castle. The ghost room is a small room with a bunk made of forged mild steel, a dressing table with a small mirror, a chair, paintings on the walls, and a small window overlooking the sea. Lenigam said that Sally seemed to be in contact with the spirit, and that's when things began to change. Lenagi, I said, she wasn't in a trance, she was focused on what she was doing. And I'm standing with a tape recorder hoping for the best. Then the room began to warm up. I want to say significantly warmer, the room temperature must have risen by 10 degrees. Then Sally started talking to someone, and there was a smell as if caused by a rise in temperature. It wasn't a breath, I mean the smell was there all the time. It smelled like vanilla, but it wasn't vanilla. Along with the smell of vanilla, there was a smell of antiquity and mustiness. Musty vanilla, I know it sounds funny, but that's exactly what it was. At that moment, Lenigam's hair stood on end. 
The medium was talking to someone in the room who was suffering. Lenigam compared summoning a spirit to listen to a telephone conversation from one end. Sally tried to calm what she later called the spirit of the woman, who was very upset. The medium then explained that it was the spirit of a young woman who was frightened and was looking for her little daughter. The medium told Lenigam that they kept her there against her will, and she said the old woman wouldn't let her leave the room. During the conversation, this woman constantly ran to the window and looked out for a man named Robert, who was at sea. The spirit did not understand why Robert did not come to her. The conversation went on for seven or eight minutes before Sally's expression became blank and she said, I lost her. Lenigam said, I immediately understood because when she said this, the smell disappeared. The usual smell cannot come and go like that one. It seemed to evaporate. There was no trace of it left. Also, when the smell disappeared, the temperature in the room began to fall drastically. Going down the stairs, the medium told Lenigam that whoever was to spend the night alone in the ghost room should not worry. The spirit was not the devil. He was just scared. Sally wasn't sure if the spirit would return that night or not. After midnight, the medium left and Lenigan went up to the room, taking with her a flask of coffee, a tape recorder, a magazine, and, she admits, some brandy for medical purposes. She settled into a cold, uncomfortable room and admitted that that night she had no intention of closing the door, turning off the lights, or going to bed. But around 2.30 she gradually began to calm down. Around 3 o'clock in the morning, the room became noticeably warmer. Lenigam said, I thought it was the effect of coffee and brandy. Then it got even warmer, and I thought, no, I was mistaken. And then I suddenly smelled that very smell. However, it was sharper. There was a smell, but the strangest thing was that it almost wrapped like a sheet. It was all-encompassing. It reminded me of how we smell clothes, hair, and bed. I sat there for about a minute, paralyzed with fear, and thought, I am a journalist, I need to record this moment, that's what I'm here for. So I took a tape recorder. It was funny when they listened to the tape the next day, but at that moment I was not laughing. So, during the recording, I say three hours morning. It's getting warmer in the room, I can smell it, and then I said, I don't like it, I'm going home. Lenagi states that she broke several Olympic track records that night as she raced down the very steep lobby stairs. She said that musty vanilla scent had followed her as she ran up the stairs, but disappeared as she stepped into the new part of the hotel. The bar's night manager gave Lenigam a drink and led the trembling BBC reporter to the furthest room from the castle, where she spent the rest of the night. At breakfast the next day, the director said that the unpleasant knocking on the door did not stop that night, as some guests in the old part of the castle complained of strange light knocks. One visitor even said that a woman entered his room at midnight, and when he got up to get a better look at her, she disappeared. After breakfast, the director suggested to Lenagii that they go up to the ghost room again and inspect it in the daylight. She got up rather timidly to that room. There wasn't that smell, and it was very cold, like when she first walked in last night. They were already leaving when the director said, Oh God, look at the mirror. She looked and saw her name written on the dust of the mirror, Kim. Lenigam said, I did not do this. Henry told her to ask the staff, but they all swore they didn't do it. The Balagali Castle Hotel is a combination of ancient charm and a bit of an assertive Irish spirit. If you suddenly hear a strange knock on the door in the middle of the night, be kind to Lady Shaw, the poor thing has suffered a lot. That's all for today. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel, like this video, and turn on notifications so you don't miss new releases and compilations. Thank you for watching this release to the end. Mr. Top F was with you. Bye.